Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I am uh, going to try and wrap this up a little bit to wrap your brains around how all this stuff kind of fits together. Uh, for me, that's always been a challenge is figuring out, you know, what do these different agencies do? Um, what do the different researchers do? Um, and how do they get it done to advance health and move it forward? So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we do in our institutions. Um, why that's not showing up. Oh, okay, well, I guess that is a different slide. Um, we are about 154 MD granting uh, medical schools in the US, 17 in Canada, about 400 teaching hospitals and health systems, including partnerships with VA, medical centers, uh, as well as 80 academic societies and faculty. So these are the people that are out in institutions that you often think about doing work to advance basic biomedical research. Right, so go down the street here, Hospital Center, Hopkins, Georgetown, University of Maryland, Howard, uh, those are our members. Now what's interesting is that those 5% of hospitals uh, represent almost a quarter, a fifth to a quarter of all the clinical care delivered. And in fact, a disproportionate amount of care to those who are underserved, whether they are uh, uninsured, underinsured with Medicaid, or those who have really complex or acute severe uh, medical illnesses. Um, we also do over half of the funded research out there. NIH is probably the best data we have in terms of the share of funding uh, and train the futures healthcare professionals and biomedical researchers. So we kind of have a view of all of this stuff, but I wanted to talk just about a couple of examples where ARC has funded work in these institutions. Um, my disclaimer would be, yes, I'm on the Academy Health Board, I'm paid by the AAMC. Um, I was trained to, be, uh, to do lab science by the NIH early on in my career. Um, the uh, Health Resources and Services Administration helped support my funding as a primary care physician. And ARC, and actually its predecessor, AHCPR, funded my training as a health services researcher. So I am living evidence that all this stuff has to fit together somewhere <laughs> um, outside of an institution or a lab. And a couple of the recent examples that I thought were, were um, relevant and interesting, ARC has funded the uh, University of Colorado as well as a bunch of other state public health departments to look at uh, rural uh, train treatment of um, opioid. Uh, disorders and pain disorders. And um, in Colorado in particular, there I think they're up to 20 rural counties now where they've partnered with clinicians to train them how to do medication assisted treatment that's generally with Suboxone or Methadone in addition to behavioral therapy because again, we know that this stuff works, but how do you get it out there? How do you get it into the hands of clinicians and how do you actually improve the health of the community? So I want you to think about this as a continuum between advancing basic science, figuring out what works at the, in, in a laboratory, to what works at a bedside, to what works in a health system, to what works to actually improve the health of a community. And importantly, we're increasingly thinking about how to make sure that those improvements are felt in a community across all populations, right? How do we get at health equity? That's not something that basic biomedical research is necessarily thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another example would be the work that many of you uh, are aware of, Peter Kronovost, who is at, at Hopkins for a number of years. Um, Peter uh, did a landmark study uh, that was funded by AHRQ looking at the decrease in central line infections in hospitals. And so while you know, Gopal talked about the advancements that uh, ARC is leading in primary care, ARC really helps us advance care everywhere, at the bedside, in the critical care unit when it comes to things like central lines. And um, this was actually, this is something I saw as a clinician, as somebody who worked as a hospitalist to see, you know, we learned that, guess what? We put central lines, these are big veins, big, big catheters that go into veins when I need to give you some, you know, increasing boluses of fluid if you're very, very sick or things that have to go to the heart or the lungs more directly. I don't put them out here. Hate to tell you this, hope you never have to have one, but you put them in here, or you put them in here, or you put them in here. Turns out the groin is a very dirty place. We needed to figure that out, okay? So the first thing that happened is we stopped putting central lines down there because the rates of infection were intolerable. And in Michigan, uh, the work that this uh, group did brought down the Keystone Project, central line infections, the median rates to essentially zero. Um, the, uh, the average rates uh, were also down not quite to zero, 
but it was significant. And I actually was working as a um, uh, consultant back in the early 2000s, uh, saw this work being done not just in Michigan, but being advanced at the national level by Peter Pronovost through the work at Hopkins and their research institute, but also uh, I saw it in um, Western Pennsylvania with the Pittsburgh Regional Healthcare Initiative. So all these communities were slowly figuring out how to do these things better. We at the AAMC, again, we're not doing basic research. Our institutions are. They're also increasingly interested in the health of those communities, as I mentioned. So one of the things that ARC has funded as is a, a collaboration between 10 academic medical centers um, that are interdisciplinary and community-based. How do we actually improve the health of populations in communities with community partners, including public health uh, and other stakeholders? So 10 institutions have come together to really to figure out how to have an interprofessional workspace to do this work, um, to develop implementation plans that are closely tied to the community uh, health needs assessments that were passed as part of the ACA uh, that all hospitals and health systems have to do. And what that's led to is, um, again, uh, improvements in uh, not only individual health care, but community health care. And it's actually changing some of the way that our um, organizations are, are organized so that we now have C-suite level people who are responsible for improving community health and decreasing disparities and improving equity. Um, that's new. I wish we had been doing this before. Um, it's just not how we were designed. Uh, and so I, I think it's critically important to think about you know, where all this stuff fits together if you think about, and you'll hear these terms of T0, T1, T2, T3, really, if you look at the circle from, from top around in a clockwise fashion, it's really talking about moving from the bench work that I was trained in in the 80s to figure out you know, how, do, how do these different pathways work, to figuring out how we then make sure that any drugs that come out of that, devices, therapies, are developed safely for human patients to figure out how we put them into clinical trials to see what's effective. We know what's effective for a patient. How do we figure out what's effective for a community? And that's where the work of AHRQ comes in. And also, as Lisa mentioned, the work of the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. All of this stuff hits in T3-4 where you're trying to figure out how to improve the health, not just of an individual patient in front of you, uh, but of a population. And I think um, you know one of the things that uh, we talked about was moving from the Bronze Age of patient safety. I mean, we've got all these data analytics now, we've got um, genomics, we've got all these things, but we have to figure out how to get them into people's hands and, and to change the way that the system works. Um, that's where ARC comes in. Uh, it's not about developing the next pill, it's figuring out how to improve the health of the population through the use of those pills, and really, frankly, training clinicians like me uh, to ask the right questions uh, and to care for the people that, that come into my office. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Lisa. She gets the hard part of the q and <laughs>